Hello everyone and welcome back to ADAP, our course on advanced design and programming. Today we will look at value objects, which is a fundamental modeling and implementation decision to make uh, during software systems development. As you look at a domain, as you look at your application and see something in there, some concepts, you have to ask yourself, am I looking at a value or am I looking at an object? And that is so important that it really starts right away in design and then goes all the way into the details of your implementation. So we'll first look in this lecture at this fundamental distinction between values and objects. Then we will be looking at how to implement values efficiently in object-oriented systems. And also we will look at a couple of quite important and very common examples um, in practice and beyond. So values and objects is fundamental to modeling and implementation. It is first a conceptual distinction in your application domain. You look what you look at what you see, and if what you see seems to be a timeless abstraction, uh, it has no identity. Uh, the concept, there's no life cycle, no birth or death, death doesn't really change, uh, then you are probably looking at a value. Um, numbers are values and so forth. In programming, then, you often implement those values as objects because you have no first class concept of values in programming languages. Uh, so you have to pl implement them as classes of which you have instances, the objects, but you make the classes and the objects immutable. That is a common sign that you're probably looking at an object or into a class that really is representing a value if the developer decided to make them immutable. Values are instances of value types, that's the wording, so there's a type for the value instances and the values then are again the instances. Sometimes it's called data and data types, but since data is too broad a term, I'm not using it. Contrast values with objects. Objects are conceptual or physical entities in your application domain. Uh, you can see them or you can conceptually see them and their hallmark is that they exist in time. They actually have a life cycle. So there was a very clear point in time where they were born and then they lived on. Maybe they still live, maybe they will live forever perhaps, but there definitely was a place or a time when they were born. So they exist in time, unlike values, which are timeless. Objects have identity. You can look at two objects which really look like they're equal, but uh, because it's two separate objects, they are two separate objects, even if all the attributes appear to be uh, the same. You use in object-oriented programming the traditional class concept for implementing objects. So you program a class and the instances are the objects of your application domain. They are mutable which means you change the state. That's the whole uh, idea of object-oriented programming here. You are, can change the object's state and thereby you perform your processing and deliver your functionality. This mutability is, of course, also where the bugs come from because you change an object and someone else holding a reference to that object now has seen you, or maybe they don't see it, uh, but you just changed uh, the floor under their feet by changing the object they reference. That's the source of bugs, that's aliasing or side effects. So here are some examples. Um, value types foremost are often called also data types, as I mentioned, but then primitive data types. So those are primitive are value types that exist in pretty much every programming language. And that's the integers and doubles and floats and characters and strings and so forth. Um, they are very general, which is why they are there in every programming language. However, value types go way beyond that. So they are common 
broadly used, broadly known value types because they are in all our lives. So zip codes or postal codes are an example of a widely known uh, value type. A postal code is not a string, uh, not a number, because it is a highly specific value type of usually in Germany, uh, five digits. So there's a lot of restrictions. It's not just a string in general. It's not just a number in general. It's very specifically has a format and so forth. The homework on Cartesian and spheric coordinate coordinates. These are value types. Uh, the homogeneous names that I'm using as an example in class and so forth. Beyond general value types, there are gazillions of domain specific value types. For example, if you're doing math with physics, then maybe you need the SI units. Uh, you need to define ranges, restrictions on those, and all of this gives you value types. Um, the finance domain has lots of value types. Currency, monetary amount, interest rates, these are all value types. Maybe you see the underlying primitive value types, but you should not confuse attribute fields and their more primitive value types that you use with the actual value type and its domain specific behavior that you're interested in. Technical application domains also have value types. Protocol names, FTP, HTTP, that's an enumeration perhaps, but well, that's a value type. URLs are value types. Return codes are value types. Uh, all of these are domain specific value types. So here's an example putting a couple of things next to each other. The number two is um, uh, a value uh, of value type integer. Uh, it's in our minds only. You make it, you re represent it, so the wording is you can represent it in various forms, for example, in the physical reality by putting, writing two on a piece of paper. Is that the value itself? No, the, the value itself is only still in your mind. Uh, you just gave it one of many possible representations by writing it down. And uh, same thing if it's in a software system. So um, uh, one zero, two bits are representing two, or the string two, that's all. These are all representations of the primitive value type, uh, primitive value two of primitive value type integer. Or consider a 10 euro amount of money. So that's a complex value type, not a primitive anyone, which has two components. There's a currency, it's euro, not US dollar, not krona, but it's euro. And then it is an amount of 10. So that would be the money and the example of value type. And that also only, first of all, exists in our minds only but of course is represented in reality through various means. Um, for example, in a printout of your bank statement, then it might say 10 euro is your balance. You could also have a 10 euro bill in your pocket. That would be another physical representation of that uh, 10 euro value. In a software system, there could be a 10 in some table or a 10 euro, two, two fields in a table, etc. If there's only a 10 and no currency, then the actual euro currency attached to that amount 10 must be maintained in the context of uh, that table. Otherwise, you're not looking at the value type. Contrast that with objects. So the integer 2 and 10 euro, the money is our values. Uh, contrast that with an object like a savings account. So a savings account has identity. It was born at some point in time and might even get deleted. In the physical world, it's represented as a booklet perhaps, but also in a paper printout for an audit trail by a bank. And of course, certainly in the software systems in a bank, that very savings account might uh, be represented multiple times, but because it has an identity, we all know or we should be talking about the same savings account all the time. So that is an object, has a life cycle, has an identity and so forth. 
Now, why this whole brouhaha about uh, distinguishing between values and uh, objects? Can't you just make it all objects? Some old school programming languages like Smalltalk, for example, say everything's an object, which is nonsense. That's just not true. So why? Well, first of all, um, as you may remember my discussion of the Scandinavian versus the American school or the modeling versus implementation efficiency, I tend to agree that you first look at the domain and then at implementation efficiency. If or not if, because it is such a fundamental philosophical distinction between values and objects, it's how you should look at your application domain, how you should capture the context uh, concepts of a domain, say you're developing software for a bank, then you will need to identify monetary amounts and interest rates as values and savings accounts and portfolios as objects. Um, if you can decide that something is a value, you actually also then get benefits on an implementation level. Specifically, values have more constrained semantics than objects. As I just said, they can't really change their state, so they are best implemented as immutable objects. Um, and hence, you can avoid lots of, lots of sources of bugs uh, that result from side effects and aliasing. So if you only knew that something was a value, you would get benefits by knowing that the stronger semantics of the concept translate into efficient implementation um, you know, ways of implementing it and uh, may, even, may even enhance system, not only remove bugs or prevent bugs, but also lead to better system performance, which I will look at it, which I will look at in a bit. So here's a quiz. What, how would you model a postal address? A postal address like where you live, etc. Is that a value or is that an object? Is a postal address a value and an object? And hence, would you implement it as a value type or as an object type or something else? What do you think? Maybe stop for a second, stop the video and then think about it and then come back. All right, so uh, the answer is slightly tricky, though it's not a trick question. Uh, I chose postal address because it could be a heavyweight object. Conceptually, it's actually very clear. A postal address is a value. Um, so there is, I wouldn't know why it could have identity. Um, uh, it's a location and that just exists. And I would think that it's clearly a value. The problem with making a postal address a value is if you then want to apply all the techniques we will be looking at in a second. And um, that does not fly well if the value is very heavyweight. You could argue a large table in a spreadsheet is also just a value, right? Isn't it a two dimensional array just in teachers? And so you sometimes decide that something that's a very heavyweight value even though it really shouldn't have identity, you model it as an object and give it identity. So conceptually, a postal address is a value, but pragmatically, you probably will make it an object with a mutable state and the corresponding source of bugs that you have to deal with. So here's another important topic, object IDs. You need to uniquely identify objects often um, so, for example, if you have multiple representations of a savings account, then you want to have with each representation associated the ID. And then across all different representations, it has the same ID associated with all these representations. And that way, you know, you're talking about the same, the one savings account with that ID. Now, for efficiency reasons within the main memory as your program is running, the ID of an object is usually its identifier, meaning the memory address where the object resides. You can sometimes inject a handle, a small object that is internally referencing uh, the, the uh, object, but otherwise can be passed around as its own object. 
but uh, that uh, you only do that under special circumstances. More common is uh, to simply have an additional attribute in the object which serves as an identifier. So that would be uh, something you generate, call ID, and it's a long string or long integer, and you maintain that with each object as if it was an attribute. First of all, identity is not an attribute, but you can implement identity as an attribute of an object. However, the object itself conceptually has its own intrinsic identity, and uh, it's also independent of the specific way of representing identities. It becomes particularly important when you try to map objects to the world of relational database tables because then in that relational database table an object usually has a primary key that kind of fills in as its identifier to uniquely identify that object within the scope of the relational database schema. So it's quite important to keep to have different instances of the same object tied together. You do that by a separate ID separate from the main memory address. And that very ID is actually a value. Interestingly enough, the identifier for an object is always a value, whether it's the main memory reference or some primary key. And so as a value type, it has its own specific semantics. For example, you usually can't add it. So the functionality on a value type called identifier is really quite simple. Usually you can ask it whether it's the same as some other ID or not, but you can't do math, for example, with it. So then, um, as promised, there are benefits to being able to say this concept from a domain is actually a value type and hence I will implement in a special way. So let's walk through that. So the first thing to understand is that whether something is an object or a value hits you right away as you try to implement some classes in Java. You may think it's values versus objects is an advanced topic or maybe even a topic you can ignore, but do so at your own peril because it hits you right away by way of the hash code and equality contract that every single class in Java inherits from java.lang.object. So what does that mean for what does equals and hash code mean for the class, whether it's supposed to represent objects, uh, the type of an object or the type of a value? Well, if a class is representing objects from a domain or the type of the objects from a domain, then two objects that are different objects but have exactly the same internal structure, have exactly the same attribute values, they are still two separate objects. They are not the same, they are not identical. Uh, they may be equal, uh, but they are not identical. Equal here meaning they have the same attribute values, but again, they're not identical. And Java defines then equals, equality, that two separate objects, even if the fields are the same, field values are the same, attribute values are the same, uh, the default implementation only compares the IDs, the main memory references of the two objects. And if it's not the same memory reference, so it's a different object, it ignores that it may have the same attribute values. That makes hash codes easy. It's probably the memory address as well. And this is very clearly different for values. If you have two values and they are represented as two separate objects in memory, you cannot use the reference. You cannot use the object ID of the value objects then. You have to compare the attribute fields, the attribute values of these of the value objects. So then the equals method needs to be overwritten and needs to go through the attributes of the two objects and compare them one by one. You don't have to do that for objects. Again, why? Because two separate objects can be equal. The two separate uh, objects that represent values can be equal in the sense of the equality contract 
even though they are different objects, if well they're supposed to represent the same, you know, the same, the, the, the same value. And it's still comparatively easy if the class of the value object is the same in the in both cases of the ob of the values you're looking at because then they have the same structure and you can just compare value attribute value by attribute value but in your homework you're working on two classes which are supposed to be representing the same values so cartesian and spheric coordinate they are coordinates they are supposed to be interchangeably usable hence if uh, a Cartesian co it can be that a Cartesian coordinate is equal to a spheric coordinate and the equality contract needs to say that. That would not be the case for something that is not a value but an object. But in this case, uh, since those coordinate classes are representing value types from a domain, uh, from the domain of mathematics or geometry in this particular case, then the equality needs to deal with a situation that the internal structure of those objects representing the values is different. And that could be, well, that's your homework. So um, you need to look at the equality contract, you need to implement equals if it's a value type, and if it's an object type you don't have to, but you use the default implementation inherited from java.lang.object. And if you're tempted to still override it, maybe you're looking at a value and not an object. So then first, yes, first now the big win. Um, if something is a value, if, an class, if some domain concept is actually a value type, then you can decide and usually should decide to implement it using an immutable class. So make the class, make the instances of the class immutable. And uh, that will, that means obviously you can't change the state of the value object. And hence you just eliminated a large source of bugs. But then as you, but then you have to change your programming style because uh, if you can't, if you have, uh, uh, if you're looking at a savings account and you want to change the balance of that saving account because it just pays in some money, you have to replace the balance value object, which is a value object, it's a monetary amount. You have to replace the old value with a new value. You can't just change the old value, which is um, a good in case the old value was used, being used in a value object was being used in a different place. That's then how and why you avoid side effects. So immutability means you do not have any mutation methods, any state changing methods in the interface of a class. And uh, that means that any of those functions or methods that perhaps in a naive implementation would have changed the state, now create a new object with the desired result state and return that. You can see that here with the, in the example with the homogeneous names. There's a remove method on names, so the homogeneous name class has a couple of strings, the components, java.lang.object is a three component name, and you could remove the middle one, so remove lang, and then it would be java.object, and now you just uh, changed the object, but you don't want that because we want, to, want it to be immutable, so the remove function will actually create the resulting value as a new object or maybe reuse an existing one and return that to clients. You can see this in the second half here where the, uh, the workhorse method, the internal primitive method to remove um, uh, creates that new, creates that new uh, name object from the result set of components after one component was removed. And so nothing changes state. The method, the, the value object, the name value object on which you called remove does not change state, but rather as a result of its work, it returns a new object, new value object, which corresponds to this as, which is the result. So this way you implement immutability. And that's a hallmark of value objects. 
In addition to immutability, you can also implement value classes or classes for value objects as shared objects. There shall only be one java.lang.object homogeneous name. And if someone asks for a new homogeneous name with of uh, java.lang.object, then they will get the get back the same old one that's existing already. So you don't have duplicate copies, you only have one copy. And if there is immutability, that's not a problem because then you can't change its state and then you can use that one copy all over the place and you're not shooting yourself in the foot. So you can define value types as shared as classes that share uh, where, where if you create a new object, you're actually not necessarily creating a new one, but you're possibly reusing existing ones. So the idea then is, as you ask for a new object, if there is the object, not if, in, if you ask for a new value object, if it's not there yet, you are creating it for the first time. And then if someone comes for the second time asking for that value object, you're not creating a second copy of the, of this, of the equal, um, uh, object, but rather you're just looking up the old one and return that. And this way you're sharing objects and there's only one value object representing the particular value. And that actually has some performance benefits uh, and downsides. The performance benefit actually is now that the equality contract of equals and hash code becomes trivial because if there's only one instance, you can reduce the equality comparison to an identity comparison. Is that other object this the same object? And if not, then it can't be, uh, can't be an equal object because there's only one instance. And hash code can use the uh, memory address or just the general implementation again because also again, there's only one instance. There's yet another technique that might come hand helpful, um, the handle body idiom where you wrap uh, a value and then use copy on write uh, uh, to um, you're creating a new instance or a new body as someone tries to call a method that mutates uh, the body. So the handle receives the method call and rather than changing the body, it just replaces the body with a new body that confirms conforms to the result. And so it has the same effect of protecting, protecting you from aliasing and side effects and also minimizes memory consumption. So the benefits again of first of all immutability is that you reduce a major source of bugs and that also immutability gives you some performance benefits in the case of concurrency. There's no need for a synchronization in Java, meaning no need for critical sections or barriers, etc. You can just run through an object like nothing multiple times in parallel. Uh, immutable objects need not worry about concurrency. If you share them, uh, you get some performance benefits from making equality easier to implement. You don't have redundant copies, so memory consumption goes down. But of course, you pay up front because rather than creating a new instance, you first have to check whether the desired value object already exists and then return that existing object. That can get tricky because you have to possibly from the input values create already uh, that new object only to learn that it already exists. So you pay up front but have a fair number of benefits down the road. There are further uh, benefits that result from or consequences arguably that result from um, the lack of identity um, you, meaning you don't have to give value objects an ID. And the most important one in a traditional relational database context is that for a database, the values don't need to go into their own table. They can be streamed 
right away into the table as a couple of columns, one column, two columns of the surrounding object because they can be redundantly written into there. Uh, they, they don't need to be maintained with their own ID. You just put the values into the columns representing the attributes. You're flattening complex value types like that, but then if you unflatten them as you load the object from a table, that's just fine. Uh, same thing happens when you serialize objects, maybe for transfer over a network. You do not have to break out a value as its own identity and own section in some protocol buffer or what have you. Uh, you just stream it as part of the um, uh, surrounding object. There's no reference to the value really that should be maintained. You just write out the values as often as you want to and uh, don't keep a table of references around. And same thing with distributed systems, because they have no identity again, um, you just copy them across process boundaries. You can't have a reference to a value uh, object in a, across a process. And so you just copy them with the objects and that's it. So um, here are, here's another little quiz on how to implement basic functions. So what's the meaning of these basic functions for values versus object types, value versus object types. So think about it is the same. That's identity equals that's equality. Clone is making a copy, but how deep? Constructors, should they be available? And what about those pesky IDs or not IDs? Give it a second, take a break, think about it, hit stop now and come back in a few uh, moments. So then uh, let's look at these in turn. Um, the comparison methods for value types. So is same uh, makes, makes no sense here really, but equals is as discussed a by attribute comparison. If you're actually uh, sharing objects, it becomes easier, but in principle, it's a by, by um, uh, attribute comparison. For an object type, uh, is same as asking, is it the identical uh, object? So that's an identity comparison on the main memory reference usually. So you implement this as, uh, is this the same other object? And equality for objects, because two objects is exactly the same attribute values are still different objects, boils down to that identity check. So hence is the same. Cloning for values should be a deep clone because, well, the, you should be copying cloning the whole uh, value object. They're usually not that deep, but uh, maybe there's a level in there and hence you do a full deep clone. There cannot be, and there should, or at least there should not be if you do it right, and hence there cannot be, if done right, any references to uh, any of uh, the elements or the attributes of a value object, nor can the value object have references to objects whose identity uh, is given and must be copied over to, to the clone. So you always do a deep clone. That of course is different for object types. You typically do a shallow clone, meaning you only copy the values. And for the objects referenced, you only copy the ID, meaning the reference, and you don't do a deep clone, which would mean you follow the object reference and also copy or clone the referenced objects. So um, that's a shallow clone and you do that for an object type. Constructors and value types should really be hidden when sharing values. Otherwise you can of course also create as many as you want to and assume that the equality contract holds. Um, hash code for value types. Well, that's just uh, the, the basic um, um, hash function, but um, for two equal values, then it should generate the same hash. If you have to give or want to give uh, the value an ID for whatever purpose, there's always some technical purpose that 
kind of violates the domain modeling, but so be it. Well, just use the hash code or use the hash code to identify identify an ID uh, or value object for the value. And for uh, for the object types, you just use uh, hash code uh, either from the superclass, which might usually is the memory pointer, reference in memory, and uh, or um, uh, for the IDs, you can use the hash code right away. Values are weirdly, even though they've been it's well understood in object-oriented systems that you should have values. Like McLennan 1982 first talked about it eloquently. Still have not made it into programming languages. It's always only an afterthought, even though it creates so much pain and so many bugs. In Java, there is a, um, uh, in the GCP, in the community process, there is a request for value objects but it's just not moving. Has been around for 10 years, uh, probably will never be realized. Would be nice though. So let's turn to some interesting examples. First one is quantity unit. You have a lot of situations where there is some quantity and then it has a unit that qualifies the quantity. For example, money is an example. Well, you have a currency, that's the unit, and you have the quantity, that's the amount. But let's use a different example. Here's a very simple design exercise. Design a function that accepts the distance and the speed and then tells you um, uh, the time uh, it takes uh, to get to go that distance. So high school math, that's not the point here. But how do you express that using uh, values. What do you think? Well, let's take a look. First of all, since this is uh, we are software engineers, we have to note that well, we may need to make a lot of assumptions. That was definitely underspecified. So let's make some assumptions like uh, it's all doubles and that precision is sufficient. We are working in the metric system and so forth and so forth. So then it really becomes simple. Um, here in pseudocode is the calculate duration to go a distance at a certain speed. In comes speed and distance, out how long it takes the time. And then it's just a duration is distance over speed. Uh, as you may know if you remember how speed is distance over time. Yeah. So uh, trivial, but look at it. Speed, distance, duration. What would you expect if you programmed this in Java be the types of these input parameters, these argument types? Could put in just doubles. How do you know then it's the speed that's being put in? The context needs to make sure, okay, the distance, how that is as a distance, context needs to make sure can easily go wrong. How about you make this proper metric values? Speed is clearly a speed, meter over second. Distance is clearly a distance, meters. Duration is clearly a time, seconds or minutes, something like that. So quantity units lets you model, that's the idea of quantity unit, uh, with SE units, the metric system then attached is the idea of properly modeling those units and not losing them. Um, so uh, we introduce a value type called a quantity unit and that has a quantity, which we decided is a double here, but that's only the quantity. We also have a unit and that would be the SE unit, so meter and seconds to the power of 15 or not and so forth. So how would you represent that? Well, here are the base units of the metric system. Uh, exactly seven. That's how the SE has standardized it. And um, of length, math, mass, time, electric current and so forth. So you probably know this from your high school physics. They have defined units, uh, meter, not kilometer, kilogram, not pounds, seconds, Ampere, Kelvin, and so forth. So how would you model that? 
uh, let me show you because it's so fundamental and common. Uh, you probably will model the base units as its own value type using an enumeration of these uh, of these uh, seven base units. But then, as you want to do quantity unit math, not just meter over second, maybe you want acceleration in there. You actually have to think about the exponents. What's the exponents of meter? If you want an area, so that's a square meter. How do you do that? And how do you do math with it? Well, you simply um, have unit defined then consisting of the base units and the exponents. So here you simply see a double exponent. So I simplified a bit and each position. So each index in exponent stands for a base unit and meter over second, for example, has the exponent one for meter um, and minus one for uh, seconds or so time and zero for the rest of it because uh, they are not uh, not in meter over second. So no candela in meter over second. And then math becomes pretty simple as you multiply two, uh, two quantity units uh, that turns into adding these two arrays and that way so um, um, uh, that way you make sure that the exponents properly propagate and meter times meter turns into square meter and so forth and this way you have a nice quantity unit with proper units so quantity units then becomes double the quantity that's easy but then the unit using the unit we just defined and this way you will never lose the meters and seconds and Kelvin and what have you associated with your quantities. So value types, uh, I said in the beginning there are a gazillion of them, that is correct, but Many of the value types are often just codes, enumerations. So there are a couple of uh, um, there are many domain specific complex ones, but the vast majority is really um, straightforward combinations of the primitive uh, value types. So they then, because of those are so many in programming languages, we want to construct them. A simple example are arrays. You have the array concept in a programming language. The parameter is the number of elements in the array and the result is an n length array and that then is the instantiated, the constructed value type. Enumerations is a programming language concept uh, where you, uh, which is a value type constructor where you parameterize it, so give it parameters that spill out, spell out the, enumer the enums, the enumeration itself, and that way you get a new value type. Beyond that, you can have parameterized types. Uh, you can either do it in during programming itself using your own facilities. Sometimes you can use generics or templates, meaning another programming language, a feature, and so forth. It happens for example, with the units, the SE units and quantity units. It can happen with something like ranges and range bounds, where you have to say, oh, I want integers, but only from zero to 10 and zero is included, but 10 is excluded. So ranges, zero to 10, range bounds, lower bound, upper bound, included, excluded, etc. So all of these are is functionality or features that you want and need uh, for the purposes of constructing more value types uh, as you find them in your application domain and as you want to make them explicit in your code so that you recognize your business needs and the business functions in your code. So let's take a look at that. Um, enums, as explained, uh, that's straightforward and they also have already built in the sharing of the values. That's quite nice. So that's if a programming language best would be if the programming language supported values itself and you could say whether a value is supposed to be immutable and shared, which they probably should be because now you 
the programming language can be um, uh, can be um, I can ensure that and in a minimal case in Java you get it with enums so um, you uh, enumerations give you shared values and uh, they really shouldn't be made mutable but um, they ideally they are un immutable uh, they should not have mutable fields irrespective of what Java tells you or lets you do well programming languages often let you shoot yourself into the foot why nobody knows just the pleasure of a programming language designer anyway so here's another example using generics you could define a range restriction right you want to have want to say integers but only from 0 to 10 so uh, you define a range uh, which restricts possible integers needs a lower bound it's an upper bound and so forth and then you can have um, can have uh, functionality whether some ranges overlap or some values included in a range or excluded and so forth and here we're using uh, generics to, to uh, create that value type constructor uh, functionality so you use that you instantiate the type and get different value types So in practice, as I already pointed out, um, there's a lot of uh, possible codes. Um, here's an old experience I was involved with, uh, but um, even though it's old, nothing really changes here because something like values versus objects is so fundamental and basic. Um, by today's means, not a huge system any longer. Back then it was large, so that was a C++ based banking, financial systems, 2,500 classes. Of these were 50 value types, only 50 you might think. But um, in addition to really fully implemented domain value types as classes, there were um, uh, 20 separate constructors, value type constructors, and more than 200, not counted in the regular classes, more than 200 enum-like value types, which are really codes. You know? So lists of uh, codes, enums really, that meant something in that domain. And then that's what you would program with. And they clearly are shared immutable and uh, also values and value types. I've been on this value object topic for more than 25 years. It really is fundamental. And if you get it right, you avoid a big source of uh, bugs and have so much easier to read software. Uh, in 1998, I think I started the JValue value objects uh, project and uh, in Java back then. Our current JValue project in research is uh, something else though it has value objects inside um, but uh, i still cherish value objects itself we are at times building frameworks for it so if you like that topic come see me maybe there's a final thesis in there so with that we looked at the fundamental difference between values which are timeless abstractions no identity and objects which are live in time they have a life cycle clearly they are born at some point of time they can be identified and uh, how this conceptual modeling application domain distinction really um, helps you understand your domain and can make your system more efficient so looking at the implementation of value objects using classes most commonly you will make these classes immutable uh, and thereby avoid side effects and aliasing and a whole lot of bugs you might otherwise create. I could possibly share them for more efficiency gains and so forth. We also looked at a couple of uh, well-known examples like how to handle the SI types uh, of units for metric system-based math or geometry, etc. and some practical other considerations. So with that, thank you very much for your time and attention and see you in class or in the next lecture. Bye-bye.